All right, are you guys ready for the main event? Yes? Yes? All right. The camera's rolling over there now. They're just hanging out. All right. I'm excited uh, to have tonight's guest speaker here. All the way from Denver, Colorado. Bill Swiper. His wife, Juan, couldn't be with us tonight, but she will make an appearance very soon at the end of this month on the uh, June 30th and July 1st at the two-day investor summit that they will be teaching our members. So Bill will be sharing some information uh, with you about that tonight. Also, uh, his lovely wife, Juan, will be doing the beginning investor group online with us next week, talking about fixing it up our uh, flipping uh, foreclosures and wholesaling and things of that nature in today's hectic economy and changing marketplace. But tonight, Bill is here. He's been doing this business as not only an investor, but an author and a coach and a mentor for 20 plus years. He's been in a long time and has helped a lot of people become millionaires along the way. And uh, those who didn't become millionaires, he helped them transform their lives and come financially free so they can do what they want and when they want, whether they're mega millionaires or not. They're free. They're no longer tethered to a job. They don't no longer enjoy. They can get out and do what they want and travel the world at their leisure. Many of you may have similar aspirations, whether you want to be a multimillionaire or just have more freedom in your life. Bill's definitely qualified to help teach you that and to share some things with you tonight. The topic for tonight is the next real estate crash. When is it? How do you see it coming? When is it? I say about four years. I've heard, I've heard 18 months, I've heard two years, I've heard two, right, four. But everybody's, we're guessing, right? Well, Bill's going to share some insight with you tonight on how he guesses and how he predicts it based on data. Being able to go into any market, whether he's from there or from somewhere else, and look at data. What's hot, what's not, what's trending out, what's trending out, what's changing. And he wants to share some of that information with you. He's also going to be talking briefly about his upcoming two-day summit later this month that I just mentioned, where he will, you can spend two full days with him, especially if you like what you hear tonight or you like what you heard uh, last week at the Atlanta Ridge Group. So I'm really excited to have him here tonight. Let's give it up for Mr. Bill Spiker. Stuff. We've got a few things we're going to cover from last week too. But how many people think the market here is still just doing great? Anybody in here? All right, who thinks it's slowing down a little bit? Who thinks we're right on the edge where it could start making a correction? Who's not going to raise your hand no matter what I say? Art, right, leave it up to you. Alright, so here's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about really what's going on in the market. How do you guys find how do you guys analyze the market? So let's look at, you know, what do you guys really think about your market and how do you know what's really going on in your market? Are you getting it from the media? Are you getting it from realtors? How many realtors we got in here? Okay, good. You guys, now here's the thing. Can realtors make money in a good market? Yes. Can they make money in a bad market? Yes. Do you have less realtors in a bad market than you do a good market? Yes. Always. That's because the cream rises to the top. I was a realtor for four years. I had my license for six, but I always was a real estate agent for four years. I sold 574 homes in four years. So I know how to become a realtor. I know how to go out and make the business work. However, the good realtors that know how to prospect and qualify and follow up and do what they're supposed to do make money in both markets. Okay, so do investors. You have less investors in a bad market than you do a good market. Everybody wants to jump in when it's a good market. So what you have to do is really know what's going on. You can't always listen to the media. You can't always listen to the realtors. We base all of our stuff on technical analysis. Okay, we're going to talk about that tonight. Medium home prices or MLS stats. Also, we're going to talk about fundamental data. How about fundamental data? Is that something you guys get? Zillow. How about Zillow? Really? Zillow? Okay. If you answer 
yes to any of these, financial disaster could be right around the corner for you. Now, if you look at this list of all the states here, states that are in yellow have one or more declining cities quarter over quarter. States that are outlined in red have one or more declining cities year over year. So if you look, there's only a few states in the country that don't have declining markets. Right? Is, is how many people in here, is this market different than the market in Macon, Georgia? Yeah. Is this market different than Athens? Yeah. What one's better, Athens or this one? <coughs> this one, who says this one? Okay, one person, two people? Oh, who doesn't know where Athens is? Where's that? <laughs> I'm in Georgia, right? I travel around so I'm going to make sure I'm in the right city. All right, I'm sounding the alarm. It says, just like I did a decade ago, long before the last crash, back in 2006, I was standing in a room of 400 people doing a multi-speaker event. On Saturday night, it was down in Broward County, and Saturday night, we had a panel. And on this panel, sorry, man. Come right, step right in. You want to take over the mic too? No. I'm on this panel, and there's about eight speakers there, eight or ten speakers, and I happen to be on the end. And they asked me, what's going to happen with the real estate market? And I said, well, honestly, I said, it's just going to go like this. And they booed me. And I said, well, boo me all you want. I said, the thing of it is, I'm telling you what I see with the technical analysis, the data that we use. I said, you can't keep building building and building. said so people don't always just come all the time. Cities and, and, and markets are cyclical. Things that go up come down. They just do. That's what happens in markets. So one guy stands up. He says, there's 750 people a day moving into South Florida. I said, well, how many people are dying in South Florida every day? I really looked at the like 653. So I see you get 97 people moving in. The 653 aren't coming back. <laughs> so I said, you've got to start looking at the raw data and start really understanding what's going on. So, you know, after we got done talking, you saw what happened to the market. I told the guys in the audience, I said, how many condos did they build from, 2000, from 1990 to the year 2000? They know they built 10,700 condos in South Florida. From the year 2000 to 2004, they built 125,000. That tells me the market's getting oversaturated. A condo is the first thing to go down in a market, and it's the last thing to come back up. So mark your condos and watch your condo prices. What's going on? Are they going? Are they starting to turn? If they are, your market's starting to turn. And that's the first. That's one of your first indicators. All that you hear these days is how strong the real estate market is. That's, that's not even the housing inventory. We're just talking about people going out and saying, listen, you know what? Realtors saying we can't keep houses long enough. So all you hear these days is how strong the real estate market is. And that and there's not enough housing inventory in the properties. You have multiple offers as soon as they're listed. Who's ever heard that? That's still happening in a lot, of, a lot of markets. It's how it's still happening in this market. And our market is, is almost identical to the Atlanta market, the one in Denver. I mean, almost identical when you start looking at the six triggers. But here's the thing. When you start looking at this and you hear, you're hearing that, you keep thinking the market's going up. But how many, I mean, how many people in here got hit with the last crash? Anybody in here? Yeah. Wouldn't it have been nice to know about a year or two ahead of time that that was going to happen so you could get in and get out? Okay? This is not what's happening in most markets, not even close. It sounds like an awful lot like we all here are heard leading up to the last crash. They completely miss in today's reality is what they're doing. Now, three things that slow down a market. Number one is interest rates. Are interest rates going to keep going down or are they going to start coming up? They're going up, aren't they? Another thing is overbuilding and supply. Are they saying, do you guys drive around and look around and see all of these places that are three, four, five stories now? That's what they're trying to do in Denver. They're trying to change the zoning to where they can, because the zoning only limits them to three stories. So they're trying to change it to like six to ten stories. 
and all the people are just fighting it because people have houses, they don't want this big 10 story building next to them. They tear down four or five houses, they put up this huge 10 story condo building is what they do, or townhome building. Another thing is wages versus pr a purchase price or rent availability. Are rents, have rents gone up here over the last couple of years? Yeah. See, there's houses in Denver that used to be 1200 bucks a month. They're now going for 23, 24, 2500. And when they have it for rent, now it's not going on that way now. A year ago, they had rent rents out there where it said for rent. They would advertise on Craigslist. You have to come between four and six Sunday night. And when they come between four and six on Sunday night, what happens is 35 or 40 couples will show up, and they all have to fill out applications. And then the homeowner gets to pick one. Now think about that competition. It's not that way now. You start seeing for rent signs. And when you start seeing a lot of for rent signs, all of a sudden, what's happening? Market's going to be changing. Okay? What are the three ways to value a property? Anybody know? Comps and MLS. Using the comps and MLS. Who said something over here? Replacement approach and income approach. What does it cost to replace it? To buy the land, to build the house, and here's the thing, in cities, be real careful if you're buying vacant lots. Make sure the sewer taps and the, wa and the water taps are paid. That could be some dicey money sometimes. That could be a lot of money if they're not paid. I had a um, subdivision I sold one time in Denver, and they were selling lots. I was selling lots for 7,500 bucks in Littleton. And there was like, Oh, I said there's probably 55 or 60 lots, but the problem is none of the sewer or the, or the water taps were paid, and the sewer tap alone was fourteen thousand dollars, and the water tap was eleven thousand. So people would go in there and they want to buy these lots, but then when you disclose that that's what they have to pay, they think they're getting a lot for seventy-five hundred bucks, but they are, but they can't do it until they pay the other step. So let's look at some markets right here. Oh my gosh, darn it. Can't see this on the screen as well as I would like. You can see it on the TVs. You can see it on the TVs. Okay, great. Good, good, good. Here's, here's the worst 10 markets in the country. Let me go stand over here so I can see. You might have to put your glasses on. One of them, the first one here, is Bismarck, North Dakota. Now remember, when we were going through a real tough time throughout the rest of the country, what was Bismarck, North Dakota doing? Boom. Boom. Remember, unemployment was the lowest up there, and all these people were moving to North Dakota. So North Dakota, Peoria, Illinois, Casper, Wyoming. I'm going to cover a couple of things with Casper, Wyoming tonight. Uh, also, you've got uh, Charlton, West Virginia. I mean, there's all kinds of properties there, but you can see that they're all red right here on the screen. And these are different scores that we have. We have a master score, we have a technical analysis point system, point score, and then we also have a star, which is a six trigger alert report. The six trigger alert report is what we gauge the markets by. Okay, that's what we're looking at. That's basically future data that we're looking at. And we're looking at um, wealth phases and stuff like that. So I wanted to make sure that you guys uh, get touched on this. Now we're going to touch on this, or not touch on, we're going to teach a lot of this stuff over the two-day workshop. Okay, because I'll have an hour and a half here, and you can honestly go on a couple screens here and go with these things for, for three hours and talk about it. Okay, well, here are some more worst markets right here, 37 through 45. Now if you notice, one of them that's in here is Valdosta, Georgia. Now that's not Valdosta. Valdosta is worse than that. Valdosta is way down at the end. Savannah, Georgia is a market that's really hurting right now. How many people have you in, in here at Work Savannah? Anybody? Okay, it's gone down like 3% in the last quarter. Okay, market has. So that means if it does that every quarter, it's going down 12% over the next year. That's a huge, uh, huge deal. Here's some of the hottest markets. Seattle. You've got Tacoma, Washington. You've got... Um, Lake, uh, Lakefield, I'm sorry, Lakewood, Winter, Florida. You've got Utah, Ogden, Utah. You've got um, 
Nashville, Tennessee is a hot market. Nashville, Tennessee, who's, who knows that? Yeah, Nashville, Tennessee is a hot market. It's like number four or five on the list right now. Here's Valerie Scott. Valerie uses our system. Valerie, she's been with us for, gosh, 10 years or so, 12 years. She's done over a, over a thousand deals in 10 years. Uh, she bought a property. They owed 300. She purchased it for 180. Sold it for 345. She made 165,000 bucks. The next one, she bought. They owed 300. She purchased it for 2095. She sold for 315 and made 105,000 dollars. Now, is that good money? Yeah. Yeah, that's great money on deals. She's done a thousand deals. Over 400 markets nationally. Right here, you'll see you've got Greenville, North Dakota, uh, um, North Carolina. You got Spartanburg, South Carolina. Savannah, Georgia is in here, right there. Savannah, Georgia went down over 3%, over 3% in the last quarter. Well, it's nice to have those TVs all around the back, isn't it? That's great. I'll show you the markets that are weak or crashing right now and the ones that you need to avoid. Also, we're going to spot the differences so you can protect yourself. All right, we're going to spot the differences so you can protect yourself. Now, real estate values on the real or inflation adjusted is what we call it, have declined in over 146 markets all over the country, which is a third of the United States. It's a third of the markets that we cover. Of the 400, 146 markets, have been open, have declining markets, okay? Remember, you do not need a housing bubble to have a catastrophic market crash. And every, catastroph every crash is catastrophic if it happens in your backyard, okay? People in Valdosta, Georgia right now are not liking the market like you guys are liking it here, okay? Big difference in, in, in markets. Now, here's how the real estate boom and bust cycles used to look. Now, if you notice here and you look on the screen, you'll see here that back in the 1980s, historically weak or strong areas would be clustered together geographically like Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. They lost around a third or more of their value in the 1980s, while the entire New England region gained 50 to 100% in value. These were the hot areas in the 80s. Okay? This is a map showing the inflation adjusted real estate appreciation rates by state back in 1987. Red, orange, and yellow colors mean super hot appreciation in real estate. Now, if you look at the 1990s, this was the weak region. And these were the strong regions. So in 10 years, it goes like this. And it comes back up. It keeps going. Markets do that all the time. Now, what we learn about indexing market, it's widespread from coast to coast, and it's serious. You, you, have, you now have a weak and crashing markets adjacent to hot markets all over the country. Investors will never see this coming. It won't make the evening news until it's already slapped everyone in the face. Demand is falling on a localized basis right now. No region is safe. Okay, no region is safe. And states now have weak and strong markets in them. Are there weaker spots in Atlanta than other spots? Yes. There is. Do you know where those are? Yes. You do, right? Some of them, yeah. Now let's look at the map now. See, when you look at it now, the western region of the, of the United States is hot. It's on fire. Washington's number one. Utah's number two. Right here. Colorado's in the top four. Florida's up there. And look what the rest of the states are doing. They're just kind of floating along. They're just kind of floating along. Georgia isn't much better than Ohio. Now, who would think that? But you know, here's the thing you have to realize. You have to start looking at your little markets that you're working. It's not just the state. You don't want to, it's, it's like we talk about, there's no such thing as a national real estate market. Okay? Because when you start averaging everything together, that's when you make mistakes. Because people say all the time, well listen, you know, you can drown 
crossing a river that has an average depth of one inch, right? If you really think about it, there might be some of it that's 10 feet deep and it's just raging waters. So you've got to stop looking at the averages and worry about your local market, what's going on in your market. Market philosophy. Local market philosophy, the driver of all real estate cycles, can and already has turned on a dime in markets all across the country. Unlike the good old days, cycles have become much more homegrown. Much more homegrown. It's now a radically different picture when you actually look at it inside the state. Market indexing. I've spent most of my real estate life figuring out how to accurately and reliably predict local real estate cycles. Market indexing is what I call it because of my success and yours depends on it. Both of our successes depend on what's what we think is going to happen. I mean, everybody in here that's buying a stock thinks it's going to go up in value, but the guy that's selling it thinks it's going to go down in value. Okay, same thing with real estate most of the time. I'll show you right here, right now, what to look for and how to avoid the financial habit. We identify current and future hot and emerging markets across the country using our best time-tested and proven market algorithms. Now, they're spread all over from Florida to, o to Oregon to Texas, Michigan, and yes, you heard it, the Rust Belt. The Rust Belt, too, is making a comeback. Some markets, Columbus. Columbus is a hot market. Real hot. Why? Well, you've got Ohio there. I mean, you've got the university. It's the state capital. State capitals always seem to do well, unless you're in Sacramento. <laughs> right? Sacramento, for some reason, just doesn't ever do anything. All right? You should, only be, you should only invest in hot markets like these. It's the only way you can really use real estate to build quick wealth and minimize your efforts and downside your risk. Now, let's look at the hottest markets here. Some of these are some of the hottest markets in the country. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, Salem, Oregon, Fort Worth, Texas, Nashville, Tennessee, Daytona Beach. Daytona Beach is a great place to invest. The city owns so many homes in Daytona Beach. They truly do. That's a great place to invest. Dallas, Texas, Salt Lake City, Eugene, Oregon, Lakeland, Florida, Palm Bay and Melbourne, Florida, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Provo, Utah, Colorado Springs, Colorado. That's the hottest place in Colorado right now. And it's about a year and a half to two years behind them. Oops, sorry. Muskegon, Michigan, and Lincoln, Nebraska. Who would think Lincoln, Nebraska? But it is. There's some great areas in Nebraska. They're truly, you could go to Nebraska and for like, you know, 5,000 bucks by half the state. <laughs> Here's Gary Prescott. Gary, Gary, he was at our, our workshop that we had down in Tampa last year down there for Dustin at the, at the Tampa Rio. And uh, he came over to talk and stuff. He averages more than a million dollars a year, 13 straight years he's been with us. He made a million for his first year. Gary's stuck now between 2.4 and like 2.8 million bucks a year. So is that a problem? Well, see, he's complacent. He's, he's, he's not happy with that because he wants to get to 5 million, but he's not willing to change what he needs to change to get to 5 million, okay? But that's okay. It's easy to get complacent. Here's my story real quick. I started my business at 23. I worked for my dad when I was a kid. He was a painting contractor. So what I did was I went out and I told my dad when I was like 21, 22, I said, listen, I want to move somewhere south out of Iowa and I want to go down to Texas or someplace and paint so I can paint year round. So we don't have to just only paint six months out of the year. I can work year round instead of just wallpapering houses and stuff inside in the winter time and stuff like that. And I knew I could make a lot of money doing it on my own. So I left my father's business and I started my own company. Now, when I started my own company, I did that in 1982. I was, at the time, 23. So I stayed in that business until 1990, late 1993. I was doing a 
oil tank, a big oil tank for Arco Chemical. I did industrial painting and sandblasting, industrial coatings on linings for insides of tanks. We had to go in and do the inside of the two million gallon tank. And we had to breathe into a tube to see our lung capacity to be fitted for respirators. Who's ever had to do that? Anybody? Yeah. Well, I couldn't pass the test. Now, you know, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. I've never done drugs. I've never been drunk. I just don't do that stuff, you know? I might look like I do, but I don't. <laughs> okay? But the thing is, I couldn't pass this test. And I got guys smoking two packs a day, and they're passing the test. And the guy says to me, the safety engineer guy says to me, well, you need to go get checked out and see what the heck's going on with your lungs. So I go to the doctor, find out I got lung damage from breathing all this silica yes. sand in and, yes. and all this, you know, asbestos stuff that we used to use. I mean, drywall compound back in the 70s when I was a kid, I'm just sanding the walls with a paper respirator on and on the outside of it says it contains asbestos. So that was back then, you know. Who's ever been around asbestos? Anybody? Mm -hmm. You all probably have, yeah. Okay, so... Here, I can't pass that, so the doctor says, you need to get out of this business and do something else. Well, I was making a heck of a lot of money back then. You know, in the 80s, in 86, I made, I made up about 350000 bucks. Now, is that a lot of money? Yeah, yes. Back in the 80s, that was a hell of a lot of money back then for somebody in their 20s, you know? But I had 52 employees, and it was like one of the adult daycare centers. It was like, who has employees? <laughs> right? Yeah, it's like an adult daycare center. So I told the doctor, I talked to him, and I said, listen, you know, I've always wanted to live in the mountains of Colorado. I've got a little bit of money saved up, not a lot, a few hundred thousand bucks. I said, you know, I'm just going to move up to Colorado and take my family up there. So that's what I did. Did that in 1994. 1994, I was up there for, I moved there in March. By the end of March, I was just like, I need to go do something. I can't, I can't just sit around and do nothing, because I'm a type A personality guy, so I need to make something happen. So. I walk into a real estate office and I thought, well, I'm going to buy some land and build a house. So I go into this real estate office, I see this realtor sitting behind the desk watching a portable old TV. And I said to him, I'm looking to buy some land to build a house. He hands me an MLS book. And he says, go ahead and look in the back, that's where all the land listings are. Do you see something you like? Go ahead. Let me know, I'll take out and show it to you. Who remembers MLS books? Anybody in here? Any older realtors in here? There we go, and they're like, I don't know, I'll raise my hand to that one. But see, the thing is, I didn't know what else to do. So he, he's sitting there, and I say to him, I go, listen, is this what you do all day long? He says, yeah, I just sit here, and I kind of wait for people to come in. And I said, okay, so how many houses a year do you sell? He said, well, I sell between 10 or 12. I said, how much you make on each house? He goes, oh, six to six to seven thousand bucks. I'm thinking this guy's making 50, 60 grand a year just sitting here doing nothing. So I said to him, I said, what would happen if you sold a hundred homes a year? And he goes, oh, you don't want to do that. That's too much work. <laughs> That's what he said to me. That's what he said to me. So I thought, this is what I want to do. I'm going to become a realtor. So I did. I got my license in July. I sold 79 homes my first year, 123 the next year, 178 the next year, 194 the last year. Sold 574 homes in four years. Then I started working with investors in 1998. I flipped 80 homes my first year. Is that a lot? Yeah. How did I do so many? I knew how to prospect. I wasn't afraid to get on the phone and make phone calls. I wasn't afraid to go door knock, and I wasn't afraid to network. I wasn't afraid to do effective lead follow-up. I wasn't afraid to qualify people. I wasn't afraid to close people. And that's what you've got to do in this business case. You're all salespeople. Who's ever dated before? That's a sales job, isn't it? I've dated two women, married both of them. So I've got a 100% closing ratio. <laughs> that's true. I have only like, dated two women, married both of them. So. Now, I started teaching in 2003. Last year we closed 49 deals in Colorado, Florida, Ohio, Iowa, and Texas. To date I've closed 1,069 deals. I'm, not, I'm a numbers geek. I track numbers. I track contacts. I track you know, everything. Because if you want to be good in this business, you've got to learn how to track your business. If not, you have a hobby. Okay, we're going to talk about that on the two-day on the, on the two workshop. I've door knocked over 50,000 doors, have made over 300,000 phone contacts. Okay?
And I know how to talk to people. That's my specialty. That's what I do. I'm not afraid to get out and talk to people. Even when I didn't know what to do. I used to call expired listings as a real estate agent. Now, here's the thing. July 19th, I got my license. I interviewed July 18th at Cobble Baker. And Donald Faber, the guy that hired me, said, he goes, well, why do you think you'd be a good realtor? I said, well, because I'm going to get on the phone and talk to people. I'm going to call expired listings for sale by owners, just listed, just sold, I'm going to cold call people. He said, okay. He says, you know, I'm going to take a chance on you. So he did. Well, by the end of July, now I'm in a, I'm in a, in a, in a office with 42 other agents. By the end of July, now I've only been there 11 days. I was the listing leader. I was the sales leader. I was the referral leader. And I got an award nobody ever got before, the Premier Performance Award, which put 10 deals on the board in one month. I only had 11 days. But it wasn't, this, it wasn't the closing leader because I had no closings yet. But the thing is, immediately I didn't make friends in the office, you know. Because I didn't go to, I didn't, you know, where, where are the realtors at again? <laughs> or yet, I didn't do the tours. I didn't go to the office meetings because it didn't fit in my schedule. My schedule was to get on the phone and prospect. So I'd call people at 7 o'clock in the morning. How many of you bill and call a bank right unless your listing expired when you plan on interviewing agents for the job of selling your home? One guy says to me, he goes, you realize it's 7 o'clock in the morning? Now, when you learn scripts, you learn what to say, stuff just comes out. You don't know where it comes from. So I said to him, I said, do you realize it's been expired since midnight? We've already lost seven hours. <laughs> and he says, you're the kind of guy I'm looking for. And we went out and listed his house that night. He wanted me to come out and list it in the morning. And I said, now I can't. I'm booked up until 4 o'clock. Would 4.30 or 5 be better? Why did I do that? 100% of other realtors would have dropped what they're doing and went and listed the house. I couldn't do it. I was set to prospect all day. Okay, that was my appointment. So that's how you get really good at what you're doing. You stick to your schedule. Set a good schedule and stick to it. There's my family right there. My daughter, Chris. My wife, Dwan, my daughter, Ayla, myself, and my son, Will, which you'll see Will. He'll be down here teaching. You don't want to miss this session on Sunday because it's all about rehabbing. And I promise you, it will blow you guys away what he's going to show you that we're doing in houses in the mountains in Colorado. Also, I co-authored a book with Dan Kennedy. Who's ever heard of Dan Kennedy? Anybody in here? Okay, I wrote a book with Dan Kennedy. 1999, I was a world champion in Taekwondo and fighting. And in 2000, 2001, and 2002, I was a Colorado State Champion. So, I might kick a female in the head. What the hell? Right? <laughs> no, I'm just not to be. But it's fine. Keeps you in shape. All right, how do you stay ahead of the market? Let's look. What we do is we wholesale and flip no equity and high equity deals. We take property subject to. We buy houses from auction.com. We buy houses from the other auction sites. That's what we do. Okay? We do have a realtor that we work with. It was so funny. I bought a house from, and, and this is, this is a, a, a little nugget here for you. Work with realtors that will let you do what you need to do to get the deal closed as long as it's, if it's above board. Okay, Scott, my realtor, I call him up one day. I had got this house off of Hudson and Marshall. And I've won the bid at 273. That's a house you guys are going to see that, that, that we're working on. It's almost done. And I called my realtor up and I said, hey, Scott, listen, I need to use your broker ID. Because I'm filling the information out. Since I won, they said, do you have an agent? And I'm thinking, well, why don't I just give the, the listing agent the whole commission? I'll give it to my agent, half of the commission. <coughs> so I called Scott up. I said, hey, I know you work for Remax Alliance. I also know your name. I know the address. But I said, I need your broker ID number. He goes, what for? I said, you don't need to know. Just give me a broker ID number. You want to give it to me or not? I wouldn't tell it. So he gave it to me. What I did was I put his information in. He sent him a check for like 7800 bucks, mm -hmm. And he didn't know it was coming. But see, he'll do what I need to have done when it comes to getting comps, things like that, because I take care of it. Okay? Every house we do, he is involved with, whether we buy or sell. We buy single family, commercial, and no equity deals, and our deals for rentals. We also do storage units. We just started doing storage units, which is fun. 
Okay, storage use is really a blast. We're buying, what we're doing is we're buying the shipping containers. Oh, nice. We bought 17 acres for $130,000 on a site. And I think it was uh, Hubzoo at the time. Now I think it's Hudson and Marshall and Hubzoo or one. But we bought it for seven, we bought it for $130,000. And the thing that's, that's nice about this site is it's 17 acres in the mountains but there's like six lots inside. It was an old, old vacated subdivision. And there's six lots inside that are all landlocked. The people don't have easements. So we're buying those lots up so we can have all of it that's inside the 17 acres. And we're putting 800 storage units on it. We're buying those little storage boxes that are 10 by or 8 by 40s. We're buying them for about 1,700 bucks a piece and putting them on there. Up there, they rent for about a buck and a quarter to a buck eighty per unit. Okay. Also, we rehab for exercises and sharpen our design skills, and we buy and create notes for long-term cash flow. How many people in here have dealt with notes at all? Anybody? A few. Good. Look at cash flow Wyoming here. Casper, Wyoming is what we call a flat, dead market. It's lost all of its momentum. See here, it's in the, the one percentile, right here. When it comes to a year ago, previous year, and now, the tap score, the bar, is over here on the weak side. Your guys' bar in Atlanta is about right here. And it has arrows going this way just because of trigger number one is a green dot. That's the only reason it made a move, made a move to, the, to the strong side. That could change real quick with the next quarter. Here's the thing though, you look at Casper, Wyoming, what we look at on these sites is we do what we call, I do a four by four, four down and four across, and do a triangle. If you notice out of those 10 dots, nine of them are red, one of them is yellow. Red means it's slow and going down, yellow means it's staying even, Green means it's going up, okay? Look at the wealth chart. This is a wealth phase chart for Casper, Wyoming. Now, if you notice, when you start looking, there's six triggers here. That's what they are. The blue line changes direction. And we're gonna cover this in a lot greater detail on Saturday and Sunday when we're here, the 30th and the 1st. A trigger number one is the blue line changes direction. If it goes up, it's a green dot. If it stays the same, it's a yellow dot. If it goes down, it's a red dot. That's trigger number one. Trigger two, the blue line crosses the green line, which is the green line is a fast market average. Generally, it's a 10-month market average. The red line is the slow market average, which is a 20-month market average. Okay, so when you look at this, when these two lines cross, this is when your wealth lines, your wealth market, your wealth chart starts. And you can notice it goes down and boom, these are where you make the money, right here. So if you could find out when you could buy here, or buy here and sell here, and then buy here again and sell here, would you make a lot of money? Yeah, but it's just understanding the technical analysis that we put together for this. Okay, you should only deal in hard facts when it comes to your financial situation. Okay, in a few seconds it takes to pull up Casper's market or any other market report, you've unleashed a lifetime of world-class research, 40 years of back testing, and millions of high-level calculations. Also, getting caught in a down cycle or even a flat cycle sucks the life out of you. It can steal your retirement right out from underneath you. How, how many people have ever caught in a down cycle? Yeah. Had a lady one time that had three houses in Las Vegas. She bought two of them for 260 each, one of them for 280. She put $20,000 down on each one, and the market just went boom, like that. Builders building houses across the street in another subdivision, same builder, same houses with pools for 209. Yeah, so she got caught and I, she says, what do I do? I said, well, you've got a couple options. One, you can just give the houses back. That's not the best thing to do sometimes. Two, 
just rent them out and take the hit. And I said, three, you can sell or finance it. With people maybe twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars down, people that have things in their credit, they can't afford, they can't buy the new homes. Okay, they can't afford, they can't get the financing for them. So she got caught. You need to come to the investor summit because we're going to cover this stuff in, in great detail. Advanced decline momentum indicator. This just came to me yesterday. We just got this in yesterday. And this shows this is a bull market here, this is bearish. And this right here is a soft market. You can see the years here, what has happened. Okay, we're just barely into a bull market, but we've just come down now into a bearish market. So we're kind of just in a neutral market nationally, okay, as a national real estate market. But we really don't look at that that much, but I just want to put that up because I got that yesterday and I thought, you know what, I'm going to throw that in. Students are talking. It says, hey, Bill, just wanted to give you an exciting update that we have just listed our first rehab below are some pictures. It says best part is we are going to make 31% return on our income with your apprentice training, 80,000 bucks, all off of it. It says we have started a condo conversion in Northern Mass and we have three other properties under contract to rehab, so we're looking to get some more private money for these, uh, these deals. Thanks, that's Alex. I just saw Alex on, online today we talked. It says, update, we made $115,000 in the first three months of working with us. He did. And he also raised $6.7 million since working with us. He's 28 years old. Now, who has kids that are 28 years old? Wouldn't that be great if that was your kid? Out there raising cash like that to do deals? I mean, think about it. Okay? Here's Georgia markets right here. Let's look at all the markets that we cover in Georgia. You've got the Athens market, you've got Chattanooga. Chattanooga, is that a good market? Yes. It's a great market. I mean, it's, 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 it's pretty darn good. I mean, when you start looking at the, at the numbers on these markets here, let me point some of those out. Athens and Clark County, 85 is the, is the master score. A year ago, the master score was 76. See, it's darker green now versus being light green. Look at Valdosta, Georgia. It's in the lower four percentile. If you start looking at Atlanta, where's Atlanta here? Number four. This is Sandy Springs area, right? We're at 74. But look at the star momentum. The star momentum, that's the six triggers alert report. It's red. What's that tell me? That tells me the market's making a correction right now. What was it a year ago? The star report, oh, we just lost it. Dustin killed it. It's all right. I'll fix it. You just no problem. It. The star report a year ago was like 30. So when you guys start looking at these and start understanding how to read this, you'll start looking at it and go, okay, listen, you know what? I think our market's starting to change. Because the first thing that you're going to notice when you get in here on these markets is you're going to notice when they're dark green, they're light green, they're yellow, they're red. You're going to start looking. You can see all the different colors here on what's going on. So if you look here, Sandy Springs is 74. A year ago, the master score was 78. Okay, or a quarter ago. A year ago, it was 73. So see, it's making a move. The master score is, is, the, is the overall score of all of these, basically, is what they are. However, the big one we look at the big one I look at is the star, is the star report. Because the six triggers is the thing that's telling you what's really going on deep in the market before, before it starts making a turn. So now, let's go here. You've about got it. We're ready. It's coming. This happens all the time, right? Good to have everybody. Okay. Athens, Chattanooga, Atlanta and a few others are looking okay. Nothing super hot in the top 5 or 10%, but a few markets in the top 25% nationally. You're, you're looking, you've got a lot stronger market in Athens than you do in any other place when it comes to Georgia. Okay, you can still make major wealth in those areas if you work in the right micro areas in those areas. When I show you the zip codes 
on Saturday or Sunday on the two-day workshop, we'll blow up all the zip codes, and you'll see the red areas, which are super hot, because the zip codes are opposite of this. You'll see the super hot areas right here. Okay, you've also got some serious wheat markets, Macon, Valdosta. They're not even 100 miles separating Atlanta and Athens from Macon. Yet they're a totally different planet. They're not even on the same planet. When it comes to creating wealth, getting those and working those areas are not areas you want to work right now, Macon, Georgia. That's not an area you want to work, it's way down here. Is that a good time to buy, maybe? Well, it depends. But if there's no momentum going right now to those areas, then you're going to sit with those properties. Let's look at this area. Let's just look at this. Look at this market right here. See here? Down, the 90s. Look at here. Cross. You see that market? Let's go down here, down four and over four. You got a triangle of 10 balls. How many in here are green? This one? Two. So eight of them are caution or stop. Eight of them are caution or stop. Is this a good market? No? Yes? No? Who says, who says it is? Okay, is this a market that looked like it might be getting ready to change? See here, it was red. It got a little bit lighter here into yellow. Got one green ball that went right back to yellow. The ones I'm really, the ones I like to watch is trigger three and trigger five. One, two, three. That's a red one. Four, five. That's a red one. These are when the green lines and the red lines cross. The green line goes up like this, flattens off, and when it flattens off, that's where it's it's yellow. It's flattening off, but then all of a sudden, boom, it hooks down. It turns red. The minute it hooks down, it crosses the red line. The minute it crosses the red line, that tells you within a year or two of your wealth cycle ending in this market. Okay? Let's look at this one. This is the Atlanta Sandy Springs market. Looks pretty similar, doesn't it? That's because it's the same one I just showed you. And you all said, doesn't it look like a good market? That's your backyard. Okay? If you notice here, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight dots are green, and two are amber, are yellow. That market's going up. That was in 1991. The yellow, the yellow, Oh, I'm sorry, the green and the red crossed over. You see that? Right here. Then it started cruising along here, boom, it took off. But look at this one. This is the crash in 2003. See, and it's, it's, it wasn't a big crash because it didn't go up that much. It went up like, what, 6 7%? Not a big deal. But when you start looking at these dots, you can see these dots right here. Nine of them are red, one of them's amber. That's telling us the market is going down. And the green and red have crossed over right here. That was the end of your wealth cycle. Look at you went along just like we did in Colorado. Didn't go up much in the early 2000s. It wasn't booming here like it was in South Florida, Vegas. Phoenix, Southern California, it was just creeping along like this, wasn't it? Those of you that were here. And the same thing in Colorado. It looked exactly the same, then all of a sudden it went boom, and it just drops. The bottom, bottom falls out in 2006, 2007. Now what happens here? 2012, mid-2012, the red line and the green line cross over again. Starting a new wealth cycle. Look at here. 10 green dots. We can see this, before, I mean, we see this and then this shows up. That tells us what's going on in the darn market ahead of time, before the news, before the realtors, before everybody else, so we know what's going on. Market's shooting up. Can you imagine if you bought right here and you're selling now? How much money do you make? You're buying at like 10, 12% below and now it's 8, 9% above. How much is that? 
27, 28% that you're making on that. Short term. Here's today. You've got two green balls and you've got eight other balls that are caution or stop. That's your reality of your market. So what's going to happen to your market? According to the way this goes over the last 30 years, your market's going to go like this. Your red and yellow or red and green lines have already crossed. They're right there. The only green dot that you really have in here that you can even use is trigger number one. And trigger number one, that's just because the blue line just went up the last quarter. Just a little bit. But the yellow or the green and the red is already crossed. So that's going to tell you that your market is making or your wealth phase is coming to an end. 10 steps to real estate investing success. Let's cover these quick. Okay, first thing you have to do is you have to have a business plan. How many people have ever written business plan? Okay, good, good for you, a lot of people don't. Okay, so how much do you want to make, what's your name? Shelby. How much do you want to make in the next 12 months in real estate? I don't know, I haven't done this plan. You haven't done that from there, okay, who else? How much do you want to make in the next 12 months? 120,000. It must be 120,000 in the next 12 months. So how much will they make on an average deal? How much do we make on an average deal? What's that? Eight to 10. So let's say he's gonna make $10,000 on each deal and he wants to make 120. So if he wants to make 120, how many deals does he have to do? 12. Well, how many contracts do you have to write to get 12 deals? At least 12, right? Well, what if half of the contracts fall apart? How many is that for right now? 24. Well, to get 24 contracts signed, how many appointments does he have to go on to get that many signed? Depends on his conversion ratio. Depends on how good he is at selling himself. Depends on the price that he's buying the property for versus the price they want to sell it for. Let's just say he has to go on 100 appointments to get 24 signed contracts. Right, to get one, to get, he has to go on 100 appointments with homeowners one-on-one -on -one to get 24 signed appointments, signed contracts, okay? To get 12 deals closed, make 120,000 bucks. Is that feasible to do? Well, think about this. How many leads does he have to have to get 100 appointments? <laughs> 500, let's say? Then we're talking about over a year. So don't get, don't think you have to do 500 on a Saturday. <laughs> okay, it's over a whole year. So he has to have, let's say, 500 leads. Well, how many people does he have to talk to to get 500 leads? A lot. Maybe 2,000? Okay, so let's say it's 2,000 people he has to talk to. And I'm not, and I don't care if you're mailing or what you're doing, you still have to talk to somebody. If you mail postcards out and people call you up, you're talking to somebody. That counts as a contact, okay? So he has 2,000 people, let's say to get 500 leads, to get 100 appointments, to get 24 signed contracts, to close 12 deals, to make 120,000 bucks over a year. He works 200 days out of the year because he's like the post guy. He only works, he's got every Saturday and Sunday off and all these holidays, right? So let's say he only worked 200 days a year, that's 10 people a day. Who could talk to 10 people a day? Everybody in here could, if that was your schedule. But then once you figure out what your numbers are and your plan, you gotta figure out how am I going to make that happen through the prospecting? Am I going to mail out stuff? Am I going to door knock? Am I going to pick up the phone and call people in distress? Am I going to put bandit signs out? Am I going to go and work with uh, wholesalers and bird dogs for them? What am I going to do? How am I going to make this happen? Once you figure out what you need to do, then you're going to set time aside and set a schedule. Well, Bill, I got a full-time job. Okay, then you have to work around your full-time job. And then when you start making as much money or more, and you start making money consistently, now I say that, because if, because if you're making 30 grand a year, you go out and flip a deal and make 30 grand, you're like, okay, I'm gonna quit my job. Well, you know, every squirrel finds a nut sooner or later. So, you know, you will run into a deal once in a while, and you will get in the way, and it will happen. Okay, so you have to be consistent with closing deals before you quit your job. 
a lot of people come to our workshop and they go, oh, you know, I'm going to just quit my job next week and work with you. And I'm thinking, hell no, you're not doing that. <laughs> okay, because you need the money for your income for right now. Let's just go ahead and set a schedule and work around, work around your job. Okay, who in here has a full-time job? Okay, good. Now you've got to learn your scripts so you know what to say to convert your leads. Who thinks that's important? If you're talking to people, you've got to learn what to say. If you don't learn what to say, I'll tell you what, somebody that's better than you and closer, stronger than you will always get the deal. As a real estate agent, I used to say when I cold call, Hey, how you doing? My name is Bill with Colwell Banker. When do you plan on moving? How long do you live this address? Where'd you move from? My chat think this guy. Should be gone in three, six months or just starting in three, six months? All we need to do now is set an appointment so I can get you what you want, the time you want. Well, that'd be great. Which is best for you, seven or eight. It made no difference what they said. You'd like to know the next question. When do you plan on moving? Never. Never great. How long do you live this address? <laughs> because it's a numbers game. Expired listings. My name is Bill. Call a banker. I know your listing expired. What do you plan on your big agent's job of selling your home until I bought the first thing? What do you want to need your next agent? Why do you think your home didn't sell? What do you have your home price at? Price you just want to write down my script. And all you have to do is once you memorize it, what happens, you internalize it and it becomes you. You start putting your tonalities into it and all of a sudden you're like, man, you just knock people over and people go, I want to work with you because they feel comfortable. You're working with late leads, people that are behind in payments, but not in foreclosure yet. People that are 30, 60, 90, 120 days late. Hi, my name is Bill. I noticed you have a pending problem with your property. We specialize in helping owners buy time to stay in the home, and I'd like you to give me this free information packet. Has your 10 options, what you can do to buy time. See, all we're doing is giving them information. What are you working on right now with your mortgage company? Oh, we're working on modification. Modification, that's great. So basically what you're saying is you want to stay in your home, correct? What am I doing? I'm getting them to say yes. See, I got people in here, I'm looking at you right now, you're nodding your heads. Now do this, nod your head and go, no. It doesn't work. So when you start getting them to nod their head, you're getting them to go ahead and agree with you, okay? Another thing, when people call you up on your sign calls, let's just say I have, you have a sign out that says, I buy houses cash. Were you there the other night? You don't call it. You have it. Okay. You've got a sign out there that says, I buy houses cash. And I call her up. And I say, hey, I saw your sign that says, I buy houses cash. How can you help me? What are you going to say? Stand up. How much do you need? Stand up. Where was the sign located? I don't know. It was on the corner of Main Street now, Matt. Elm. Okay. Hear this? <laughs> That's okay. I'm not picking on you. Because you know what? I know, but I could, I could go 99% of people and just said the same thing. Okay? Thanks. Okay, you wanted to sell. When, when somebody calls you, the first thing you've got to do, guys and gals, is take control of the conversation. If not, they're in control. All right? You've got to take control of that conversation. And the people agree with me, the people that have more money in the room. Okay? But you do. So, a homeowner calls you up, hands up the proper, that, that sign you get says, I'm a house of cash, how can you help me? Well, my name is Bill, I'm on a cell phone right now, I'm not in a great era, I think it's your name and number, keeps me disconnected, and I call you back. They give you their name and number. And they go, how much is that house? Well, I put signs in the front of vacant homes that are owned by, by banks that aren't listed with agents. I just put signs in the yard, says, I'm a house of cash, rehab or wanted, cash buyer wanted, <laughs> And I put a sign that says seller financing, rent to own. I put signs like that in all these vacant houses that, don't, that aren't listed with agents. Why do I do that? Because those signs stay there for two years. Yep. <laughs> they take them down on the corners, and they'll stay there forever. So here we are. We're putting a sign in a vacant yard in Las Vegas with a guy named Matt that I'm training that lives in Japan that's moved over to Las Vegas. Put a sign in the yard. We drive down the road. We're not even not even a minute away from this house. Phone rings. So I said, hey, looks like you got a sign call or something. I said, you recognize this number? He goes, no. So I answered his phone. I said, hello. He said, hey, yeah, I'm calling about that uh, sign you've got in front of that house on 123 Elm Street. I'm thinking, that's, we're still on Elm Street or whatever street it was. 
So I said, well, my name's Bill, and I'm not in a great area. Let me get your name and number in case we get disconnected. I can call you back. He said, I want to give him information. So what I did? I hung up the phone. He called me right back. He said, Bill, we got disconnected. I said, I told you I'm not in a good area. <laughs> I said, I told you I'm not in a good area. He said, I need to use your name and number in case we just said, I don't want to give it to you. So I hung up again. He never did call me. But you know what? All it was was a nosy neighbor. Hey, it could have been a cash buyer next door. But you know what? Hey, if you can't take control of people right off the bat, get rid of them. Let the other people work with those idiots. Right? Absolutely. But you're afraid to take control of the conversation because you don't prospect. You don't have a schedule. You don't know what to say. And you're like, oh my god, I'm in law thousand bucks here. There's one car, one call. Oh, I'll do whatever you want. You want me to come over right now? Okay, I want <laughs> You want me to list your house for how much? It's worth 200 You want to list it for 300 Okay, I'll do it. You know, because you're desperate. Your tonalities sound desperate. And, the, and then that's because you don't know how to take control. You're afraid to take control because you don't have enough leads coming in. That's why you have to keep that machine working. Okay? Next thing, structuring deals and exit strategies and closing them. You've got to learn when a deal is a deal or if it's not a deal. Well, you just texted me today that uh, my son's training, but he was out of range today. So she texted me and said, I can't get a hold of Will. Um, I said, well, he's working at one of our properties. And I said, uh, he's in an area where there's no service. She goes, I got a question. She goes, I got a lady going into a nursing home. She only owes 38000 in our house and worth 150 she goes, but she's going to a nursing home in like 45 days. Nursing home's going to take all mine on this deal. But the Shriners have a lien against her house for like 125000 bucks, So it's upside down. So I'm working with her on that. But the thing is, is the lady's going into a nursing home. You know, they're going to ask you, have you transferred real estate in the last 12 months or 24 months, or whatever state you're in, or, you know, so you got to learn how to close the deals and also strategies. Also, rentals, notes, and REOs. You've got to collect some rentals if you want, or, make, or create some notes. Create some notes. Long-term investing and indexing. You don't always have to buy all of your properties right in your own backyard. You can take $20,000 and stick it into a market. If you could turn it into $120,000 in a year and a half, do you care where it's at? No, it might not be here, okay? It might be somewhere else. That's why it's important to understand indexing, and we're going to talk about that over the weekend. Also, asset protection. How many people in here have their own home in their own name? Okay, that's a no-no right off the bat. You've got to get them out of your name, put them in land trust. If you're going to put them in LLC, put each house in a different LLC, because if somebody gets hurt on that property, and I can tell you, Dwan's dad, my father-in-law, He's, he has eight houses paid for up in Dayton, Ohio. Doesn't sound great, but it's up in like Troy, Vandalia. It's a nice area of Dayton. On the north side, northwest or northeast side. Houses are 90 to 130,000. They're all paid for. He's got eight of them. His primary residence is paid for worth a couple hundred thousand bucks. He's 81 years old. And he says to me, now I tell him, I said, Dad, so you're driving around, you've got one eye. Because he went blind in one eye because he had a blood clot and he lost sight in one eye. So he has no perception of death, death perception. So he's driving around, you know, just like wandering around. <laughs> he's got all these paid rentals. I said, Dad, you gotta get those out of your name, man. I said, you gotta get them in the land trust. And I said, we just gotta do this. It took me three years to talk him into it. He goes, they're my house. I get that. Attorney's going to say the same thing. They're your houses. Okay, you hit somebody or something happens, they're going to take your houses. You hit somebody, somebody else hit somebody, and they have nothing. They're just renting an apartment and they, they have a car that's worth 800 bucks that's paid for. Attorney's not chasing them. Attorney's chase what? The money. The money. That's right. So it took me three years to talk them into doing it. So I'm like, okay. But you've got to protect what you work so damn hard for. And it's so, we're in such a Sue happy society. I went over to Korea back in 2004. Went over there for Taekwondo and stuff. And I'm sitting 
in this restaurant on the corner of a busy street in a, town, in, in a place called Itawan. And I see this guy driving this little moped, and he's got all these boxes on the back and carpet sticking out. And he's going between cars and going, hitting the cars with the carpet, just going between cars. He goes and cuts this corner, a van comes around the corner and hits him. I'm sitting there, I saw the whole thing. Hits him, and Jesus, boxes will fly in, he goes flying, the guy in the van gets out, and I'm talking a van, we're talking a van about the size of that table. So he has a little van, not a, not a big monster van. So he hits him, and all of a sudden, the guy in the van comes out, he looks at him, the guy gets up off the motorcycle, they dust each other off, and he helps him stack his boxes, and where they go. <laughs> I'm like, that wouldn't happen in the United States. <laughs> They'd be like, whoa, call the, call the cops. Get my attorney on the phone. But see, we have 94% of the lawsuits on earth are in America. 94%. We get 93% of the attorneys in the world in America. So we're in a Sue Happy Society, so it's important for you guys to protect your assets. Working the right areas and the top zip codes. There's areas around here that you guys should be working versus other areas. There's areas around here that's only went up 2% last year, and there's other areas that went up 18 And they're right next to each other. So why would you work the area that's going up 2% versus the 18 Work the hot areas. Also, building a predictable and duplicatable business. It's all about building a predictable and duplicatable business. Now, the workshop. The two-day workshop, you just got these handed out. Everybody in here needs to be there. Whether you make a lot of money or you don't make a lot of money, you need to be in there because you're going to learn something. Who learned something here tonight so far? Okay, good. Half of you. Great. The other half are still sleeping. I won't talk that loud. All right. Wholesaling properties in today's market, whether you're wholesaling notes, REOs, no equity deals, high equity deals, or just sales contracts. Okay, because we're going to show you the difference between high equity deals and no equity deals and how to get the high equity deals when you don't have the cash to get them. Okay, against the cash buyers. Because what we find out in Colorado, homeowner has a house. It's worth $350,000. They owe hundred. I'm going to give you an example of one we just ran into last month about door on it. $350,000 it's worth. She owed $111,000. She has three cash offers. She's going to sale in, in about 10 days. She has three cash offers between 120 and 140. That's what the cash buyers are doing. They're coming in and offering low because these people are, are going to lose their house and get nothing. So they get five or 10,000 bucks. And then they'll put the house on the market. They'll just pay the mortgage off because they have the cash. They'll put the house on the market. They'll get the house deeded over to them. And they'll sell it. For 290 or 310, and they'll make 120,000 bucks on it. Well, wouldn't it be nice to do that to a point? But it's not good for the homeowner. The homeowner lived in there 13 years. That's not a good deal for them. You guys have to put the homeowners first in a lot of these deals because you reap what you sow in life. You go in and just take somebody's equity like that and 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 suck it out and give them 10,000 bucks when they're sitting there with 150,000 or 200,000. I'm sorry, 200,000 dollars for that. I mean, that's not that's not a good thing to do. You know what? Give them more money than that. You know, so we're going to show you how to do high equity deals and partner with the homeowners. And we're going to show you how to do financial risk assessment fees. And we're going to show you how to how to split it with the homeowners, move them out, fix it up, and sell it. And you know what? They'll pick you every time over the cash buyers. Because you're really doing what's best for them. You're giving them a big chunk of the profit and the change. And you know what? All they have to do, we give them what we call move out money. So equity advance is what we call it. Seven ways to find leads your competitions don't even know about. Also we're going to talk about how to, per how to partner high equity deals. The missing link to internet marketing. That's a huge one. You guys be like, ding, okay, I, I get it now. The 10 options to help and close deals your competition's not chasing. We're also going to talk about, we will show you how to create notes with massive profits. We're also going to learn markets and what's going on uh, in your markets and when markets are going to make a correction. Okay, and, and on the two days, what we'll do when we pull this up, you guys can give me areas, we can look at states, we can look at cities, we can look at zip codes, we can look at neighborhoods. 
okay, and tell you exactly what's going on in those neighborhoods, percentage-wise, okay? How to close a deal for $30,000 profit in less than 30 days. How to close no equity deals in today's market for today cash. Who wants to make today cash? Like money right now, okay? Everybody's got their hand up needs to be there. This, not this week, it's next week. Okay, how to buy right of REO auction sites. And then learn what to say to convert your leads. That is so, so important. George, you leave us? All right. You can leave, nobody else can. All right. George already told me you can leave early tonight. I said, okay, sounds good. So register tonight. Also, what we're going to do at the two-day workshop, we're going to talk about millionaire marketing. Millionaire marketing. Why 99% of investors fail in converting their leads. We're also going to talk about what is your cost per lead. If you mail out a thousand postcards, it costs you 500 bucks, and you've got five calls, what do those calls cost you? A hundred bucks a piece. You better learn what to say to close them. Otherwise, you're just throwing money out the out the door. You know, it's so funny. I'll tell this quick little story. I was here a week ago. When I left, there's a lady playing. Is this a shovel? At the airport. And I just walked by and I thought. People are throwing quarters and stuff in there, dollar bills. So I just walked by and I thought, oh, I'm going to slide her a 20. So I threw 20 bucks in the box. Walked away, didn't they think anything of it. Today I'm walking down the airport. Point to our bill is my own floor. I go, hey, there's my 20 bucks back. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to the airport tomorrow and get a lady to point. <laughs> this money come, easy come, easy go. All right, so what's your cost per lead? Where are your wealth phases in your area? Where's the next wealth phase going to be in your area? We're also going to talk about where will the next market gain momentum in your area and how to market index with your zip codes. Also, how to market, brand, and sell yourself. That's going to be really important because you want to be better than the competition. How many people in here really believe if I was your competition on a house, you'd get the deal over me? One person, two people, three, four. See, you guys are the only ones that stand a chance. The rest of you already lost. Because you'll come up with excuses on why not you go on the appointment because you know I'm going to be there. I used to have agents, honestly, in our office. I'd set an appointment and then they'd set an appointment on the same house. And then they would call back and cancel because they knew I was going on the listing appointment. <laughs> and they figured it's better to have me go against Ray Max than them go against Ray Max because I was getting a lot of the listings. So my whole thing is you have to be better than your competition. I had a guy named Tupper Briggs one time. 1994, July, I get my license. In November, I get a call from the number one agent in the area. He's like number ten, well, like in the top ten in the country for Remax. Calls me up and he goes, hey Bill, he says, I'd like to take you to lunch. I said, okay. I'm thinking, what? Cool, because I take an hour off for lunch. So we go to this place called the Keys on the Drain in Evergreen, Colorado. And I said, hey, you know, what's up? I said, it's nice to meet you. He said, well, I'll tell you one thing. He says, you are a jet boat in a stagnant pond. That's his first thing he said to me. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I gotta tell you what, he says, you come in and you just do what all other realtors aren't willing to do. He says, how in the heck are you getting, by this time I had 62 listings. He said, how are you getting all of your listings? And how are you doing what you're doing? He said, I know you're calling expired listings because every week we have a 10 minute session in our office that's dedicated to how Bill Twyford's taking our business. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that's what he told me. <laughs> I said, seriously? He goes, no, I just mom they can't stand me. <laughs> so now, here's what happens. About six, eight months later, six, eight months later, the lady from that runs the office in the MLS at Remax starts calling me, saying, hey, Bill, listen, I just want to tell you, one, two, three, Elm Street, we released it, it's going to show up expired tomorrow. You haven't got to be listed in the MLS. Please don't call. <laughs> now, is that a nice thing to be the person like that? Because... Because they're looking at, holy cow, if, if, if this thing, now you know they're saying, if this thing hits the expired, you know Twyford's on it at 7 a.m. Because I was. But see, that's the thing. You want to be that dominant in your market. That's where you make all the money, guys and gals, is learning how to beat the competition. My mentor, Mike Ferry, always says, he goes, the way you deal with competition, you just crush it. And I said, oh, thank you. 
<laughs> but the thing is, you've got to be better than the competition. Okay, working with us will change your life. Become, become our partners on your next deal. Also, reach your dreams faster. We give you one-on-one -on -one real estate in the field hand-holding training. Okay, we make sure that you have the support you need. Okay, we make sure you have the support you need. Also, we're going to hold your hand. You're going to get my cell phone number. When a speaker is here talking, and he doesn't want to give you a cell phone number, don't buy anything wrong. Sorry, Dustin. He's telling you, he's telling you, you're not important enough to have my number. Okay? This weekend or next weekend, I'm going to give you my cell phone number. You text me. Get a room this size. I'd be lucky if I get 10 people to text me. 10 out of everybody. What I'm doing is qualifying to see if you're going to listen to what I tell you to do. Okay? Investor summits, $29 for gold members, $49 for silver, and $99 for non-members. So those of you that are not non-members, where are the non-members tonight? Where are you at? Raise your hand. You should become Ashley. You already proved you don't know what you're talking about. But you <laughs> That's worth 100 bucks right there. But see, there's $99. You've you, you come free, right, Dustin? That's correct. Yes, there's a, a two-for-one special for existing members. If you join tonight, you can come for free. When you join tonight, here's exactly what's going to happen. You'll be able to come free to the workshop. And if you renew your membership, you can come for free. And when you renew your membership, you'll come for free. Here, what we just did, we changed that a little bit, didn't we? If, when. We don't want to use that. We want to use when. When you do this, here's what's going to happen. Okay? Right? Yes. That's some of that neuro-linguistic programming. That's NLP stuff. That's that good stuff. Okay, also what we're going to do, it's June 30th and July 1st. So it's not this Saturday and Sunday. That's that's um, Dave's workshop, right? Dan. Yeah, uh, Don and myself Don, Don. have one Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. This that's is the right. following week. This is the following week. June 30th and the 1st, it's going to be over City of Lights. City of Light. Okay, and how many people in here know a good title company? Anybody in here have a good title company they work with? Okay, right here, Senku, and right here. And just so you know, Bill, here we use the title, uh, our uh, closing oh, attorneys. Oh, closing attorneys. Attorney same state. same okay. thing. Okay. It's the same thing in Iowa. It's closing attorneys there, too. So, But uh, other than that, uh, who had fun tonight? Did you have fun? Thank you very much. Um, Say food, go see him hey, right Bill, over there. Yes. Do you mind taking a couple questions? Oh, yeah. No, I'll take all kinds of questions. All right. I got at least two that came in online. Okay. Now, the first one's kind of... So, how, how old am I? 60. No. Oh. Okay. And you're not single, so... No, I'm not single. I got two rooms. Right before you got into the 10, um, the 10 steps, yeah. you basically were showing some um, things on the screen that basically said, this area, I believe, St. Springs, which we were talking about at the time, was kind of going, starting to cross over the line. Yes. All right. You kind of left it there. Mm -hmm. Are we getting? Yeah, let me turn it on. Uh, sorry about that. I didn't have my mic on. You were, were uh, kind of left us hanging, saying that this market may be getting ready to turn and go in the other direction. Mm -hmm. I say within within a couple years. All right. Having said that, I, and that's a wealth phase. Correct. So, so you're still, if you if you notice on the chart, you're still at about eight nine percent up from the low point. So the question is, when it starts to go in the other direction, are we out of luck? Well, no, you just have to be, you just have to adjust your prices to let the other homes sell your house. And I used to tell that to homeowners all the time. Listen, all the houses in this neighborhood are between $289 and $299. Let's list yours for $279 and let those houses sell your house. So I'm trying to pull some information out of you. Okay. I've always been told, and many of you too have, that we can make money in an up market or a down market or a yeah. declining market or a rising market. Yes. So when the market turns, lately you know we've been fixing and flipping. We've been fixing and flipping yep. a lot in, in uh, Colorado. Yeah. When it starts to turn and that wealth phase shifts, what phase is it going to for us? Well, here's the, here's the, the, the neat thing about it. And we just started in Denver. We had two banks that we're working on right now with short sales in Denver. And Denver is a market just like this. So in the next couple years, they'll start coming back because banks are still doing short sales all over the country in a lot of these other markets. 
Youngstown, Ohio, Akron, Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, Detroit. Did anybody hear that Detroit went like this? Yeah. It did, didn't it? But you know what? Detroit's going like this right now, but they don't know it yet. Okay, but it's making a turn. Pontiac's making a turn on the west side versus the east side of Michigan. So yes, when things are turning, there's different exit strategies. You, when, you, when you're in a market that's up like this, you'll find that the baseline is here. People have a lot of equity in their house. When the market starts to turn and they're trying to stay ahead of the market selling their homes, what they've got, a lot of people, there's a difference between people that have to sell and people that want to sell. People that have to sell are people in distress. Those are the people we're focusing on. When people want to sell, that's not who I'm focusing on in my business because they want to sell so they can list it with a realtor. There's no timeline. And they're not behind in payments. So they have the time to ride out the clock a little bit and work their, their, their price down. And people that have to sell are the people that we're targeting. And what we're trying to do is help them out. They've got a lot of equity. We're going to equity split with them. Or if they just want a little bit of cash and walk away, we're going to take the house subject to Okay. Okay? And then we're going to turn around and create a note and sell it for a little bit higher price, even in the declining market. Because remember, when you sell an owner finance deal to a homeowner, you're taking down a decent percentage up front for a down payment. You're creating a note. And then what you're doing is they only care about two things, the new buyers. They, care, they don't care about the interest rate. They don't care about the purchase price. They care about how much money down and how much money per month. I've got a, uh, I've got a 15, $14.5 million piece of property in Malibu, California, 330 feet of oceanfront property. It's worth about 14 million bucks. How many people in here would give me 18 million for that? Nobody. My terms are just a thousand bucks a month. That's all I want. No money down. Now who wants it? See, now everybody wants it. So see, the thing is, you get terms or price. So when the prices are coming down, you have to offer terms. Okay, when a market's turning, you just have to look at each situation. So this kind of leads to, um, I believe her name was Epic's question. And I have no idea what these questions are. <laughs> this is all, we'll, we'll, we'll let the audience ask a couple. These are a couple yeah. of what I was checking earlier were coming online. Let me grab some um, water quick. You were kind of mentioning that um, making what in such a hot market, um, especially for selling right now, it's not like a seller's market. So her question was, is it a good buy and hold market? If it's not a good retail market, is it a good buy and hold market? Well, it just depends. If it's a, if it, I mean, it could be a good buy and hold market, but you got to find out what is the payment on the house? What are you purchasing the house for? Are you taking it over subject to existing mortgage? And if the payment on the house is 600 bucks a month and you can rent it for 1200 bucks a month or 900 bucks a month and you can positive cash flow that thing, you can do those deals all day long, okay? But if it's a deal where the payment's 1200 a month and rent's 800 a month and they're nine payments behind, that's not a deal. You're gonna have to short sale it in a market like that. And they will short sale and make in Georgia. I guarantee you they will. So in a hot seller's market like this, where you sell houses fast, mm -hmm. hours, hours, yep. is it a good buy and hold market? Right now, I wouldn't say this is a good buy and hold market right now, unless you're long term. And if you're going to put a lot of money in, into real estate right here, you're better off to pick some emerging markets yep. and go into those markets and put your cash there and then get out of those markets and wait for this market to, to, to bomb, bomb out and come back. Is it a good market to buy and hold if you're buying it creatively subject to? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah, as long as the numbers work. Yep. That's good. the thing. Because you don't want to be buying at the top of the market for all no. cash, right? And taking no. out loans. Oh, no. No, heck no. That's the end. And you know, you guys hear these commercials. You heard them back in 2006. Take out 125% of your mortgage. Who's ever seen those commercials? Anybody see those commercials? They're all over. They're now offering 125% of your mortgage. Why? Because the market's gone like this. And now they're going to go ahead and suck all their money out of the, all their equity out of the house, and the market makes a turn. All of a sudden, what happens? They owe this, and the house is now worth here. And that's where your short sales are coming in. Okay? And I don't want to be the bear of bad news because I because I, I, I'm not predicting anything. All I can say is markets are cyclical. You can see that on the one. It's about a seven to eight year market right here. The last two have been seven to eight year markets. One was a six. This market started in mid-2012. You had seven years, you're 2019, maybe 2020. 
So you're you're and, and you're thinking it's about four years, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's nothing and he may be right. You know, I'm just going by technical analysis of what I'm going by. Before I take your question, that. one more follow up and we're gonna turn it over to the audience. Okay. I just didn't want you to leave, especially since a lot of people here are new, that hey the marks ran across this not a good time to buy. No, 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 no. I, I want to make sure you left on yeah. a positive note, knowing yes. that we can buy when it's up or down. So yeah. This is a seller's market. When it turns down directly, it becomes a buyer's market. We can buy easy. And and when is it a buyer's market? When there's more than six months worth of inventory. Write that down. When there's more than six months worth of inventory, it's a buyer's market. When there's less than six months, it's a seller's market. Now listen, I just all I want you guys to understand is I want you to make sure that you can still do deals in a good market or a bad market. Right. You can make money. It's all what's between your ears. Mm -hmm. It's what you believe. If you believe you can make money in a market that's going down, you can. Yep. If you don't think you can, you won't. So the title of Bill's presentation was, Your Market Just Crashed. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. So if it's going in the other direction, what are you going to do about it? If it's going back up again, what are you going to do about it? Because we make money in either a market if you know what you're doing and have the right education. And when you go down to the, to the neighborhood and the zip code area, you're exactly right. There's some four or five year areas that are still strong and they're real strong. Yep. But you've got areas that are just right next to them that are just flattening off and just tanking. And you know, it's just knowing where to work in the markets. That's what it is. Uh, let's take a quick, few quick questions from the audience. Okay. Before we get started here, then I'll work my way back that way. My question is about the class. So when will you have another class? Because I won't be here that weekend. You won't be here that week? What are you doing that week? I'll be in Maryland. You'll be where? In Maryland. Maryland. Well, I won't have another class here for a while, will I? No? Uh, Bill just started speaking for us last year. This will be his second one. So he wants to come once a year. Okay. Will you have another class somewhere else? Yes. Yeah, I have classes all over. Um, well, so with us, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, with, I haven't got any in Florida and Tampa yet. We'll find them down in Tampa. Okay. Yep. So who wants it? The schedule, where you be for those people? We just had him in yeah. uh, Charlotte, so you missed that one too. Okay. But uh, he does not have that access to the information yet. We haven't booked yet. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. But if you can, definitely try to get to one for sure. Uh, there, well, I'm sure would you have access online to repeat it like a Zoom call? Or would you again. have access to the classes online? Oh, yes. So Maverick folks are out of town. Now, Maverick knows that we do record some of them and Zoom okay. some of them. We're not doing this one. Mm -hmm. Which is okay with me. I don't care. You know, but I would have, I have, to, get, I would have to get his permission. And it's yeah. not something we've talked about. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But if a few of you need it, and you know what, I love your voice. You hear my man? Absolutely, Nipsey Russ. All right, well, let's make it happen. You do. Yeah. You got me like this. You know, I love that. All right, I'm gonna make my way to the back and saw some questions back here somewhere. What's what's happening in the Charlotte market? Charlotte market. The Charlotte market is is about a year behind this market. Charlotte market still going like this. The red and green hasn't crossed yet, like it just did here. Okay, so the red and green are still running parallel in, a, in an upward phase. The Charlotte market, when you look at the dots, it has a yellow dot in trigger number one, and the rest are all green. Are you going to cover how to do deals in other areas than where you live? Yes, okay. yes. We're going to cover how to do deals, how to invest in other areas. Okay. So we invest in five different states. Okay, let's get one over here. I see some of you guys going like this. Is it hot in here? Yeah. I had a question. You you said something that kind of triggered something in my mind. You know when you said about the. He did that intentionally, by the way. Mm -hmm. Those financing for the 125% um, over yes. what you owe. How is that similar to when the market crashed and they were selling those houses at ridiculous prices, and then the people, the mortgages and the banks, you know, crashed and all Same that. Same thing. What happens is somebody buys a house five years ago in this market. They buy a house for 200 all of a sudden now it's worth 310 We have a stupid market like that in Colorado. We work in area 80219. Houses are 80 to $120,000 homes. Now you can't find anything under 350. Right. I mean, it's just stupid money is what it is. And you have the same kind of a market here. But the thing is, when somebody buys a house, 
six years ago for 200, now it's worth 310. They're sitting there going, wow, you know what? I got good credit. I got 110,000 in equity. I just saw this commercial, Bank of America is doing 125% of the value of your home. I'm gonna call them up. And he calls them up, they come out and raise a house for 310. They give them $350,000 loan on that house. Now they're upside down, but they take the money out of the house and they pay off all their credit card debt of 80,000 bucks. And then what happens? Their payment goes up, but then they run the cards back up. And now the market turns a little bit, and now the house is worth 250, and they owe 350. Now what do you do with that deal? Short sale it, basically. Depending on what the loan is on it, how many payments are behind. But if the payment on that house is 1,200 bucks a month, and you can rent it for 2,000 bucks a month, and the homeowner's one payment behind, they just want to walk away, would you take that deal over? Yeah, you can take that deal over. Just keep it long term. Rent it out. Are rents going to come down when prices come down on homes? Good. Okay. Next question. Oh, we got one back here in the back. That graph with the dots. This will be a tough one here. <laughs> no. That graph with the dots, what do you find out there? Graph with the dots, today's real estate markets.com. Today's real estate markets.com. So today's with an S, real estate markets with an S.com. Okay? And if I was you guys to sign up for that site, I would just, you can do regional, you can do state, you can do city. If I was you guys, I would just do the pro site, I would do all the United States so you can watch all markets because if you're looking to build wealth, hey, I'm not done yet. If you're looking to build wealth, see, people do what you tell them to do. And now Pete Ross done it. You got to go? Oh, yeah, go pay. Okay, if you're going to pay for the week, you can go. Okay, you'll be one of the first ones. So what you're going, what you're going to want to do with that, I lost my train of thought. What was I saying? Get the pro site. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just get the pro site and, 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 and do the whole United States or do the southeast region or wherever you want to invest. Because the thing is, there's wealth markets all over the country. But like I said, 146 of the markets went down. All right? Out of the 400. And we have micro markets, all kinds of markets all over the country. All right? Okay. What's that? Today's with an S, real estate markets with an S, oh, markets.com. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Okay, any other questions? Who had, who had one more question. Oh, one more. We'll take one more if you've got one. Then we're giving away $2 million cash. All right. <laughs> From you. Look at it. Yeah, we got it. We got, we got, it. We got, we got it. We got it. We got it. I love this guy. I'm going to have him come to my in Colorado. We come to Colorado, come to think of it. Give me a call. Okay, I need your number. Well, I'll give you a number. Let me give me a cell number. All right. All right. Who wants to do the last question of the evening? Martin, you got one for me? Uh, we need to do the market research on there. What's that? When you, when you guys are doing the market research on there, when the market starts to pan out, right, and you're already still you're holding the house, What's your exit strategy on that? When a market starts to turn, our exit strategy all depends on, again, what's owned on the property, what we can do with the property, if we can sell or finance it. When a market's going down, you're going to find out there's, when you start offering terms, it's easier to get rid of properties than it is to, unless you've got a lot of equity. You've got a lot of equity in it, and let's, say, let's use some numbers. Let's just say you've got a $300,000 house, and the market's starting to make a turn down, and you only own like, 180 on this house. Well, all the houses in the neighborhood are listed between 280 and 290. You want to list yours for like 269 and get rid of it and beat the other ones to the market because maybe in six months, 259 would be the market in that area, okay? So you want to get ahead of the competition, get ahead of the houses that are for sale in a market that's declining. When a market's going like this, it's the opposite. See, in Colorado, we, we have a lot of people that use escalation clauses. Does anybody know what that is? All right, escalation clause. Escalation clause is, is a clause they put in the sales contract that says we will pay $310,000 for this house. However, if somebody overbids us, we will go $1,000 more than they bid on their offer up to $325,000. So somebody puts an offer of $320,000 in, boom, yours is automatically at $321,000. They don't have an escalation clause, then what happens? 
is you get the house at 321. We listed one of our houses just about a year ago that we sold it right away. We had four offers the first day, three with escalation clauses, and they would go to three, one went to, would go to 335, one would go to 338, one went to 342. But their offers were 319, 323, and 325. I took the offer of 325 because the guy was putting down $120,000 cash and he had good credit. And I, I, I could have I bumped it up to 340 because he would go up to 342. See, most people would bump it up because you've got the light escalation clauses. But I knew it wouldn't appraise because of the square footage and it didn't have a garage. And a garage is a big thing in the mountains in Colorado because sometimes you get this much snow. Right, so garage is a huge plus. And not many houses were for sale for over 340 that didn't have garages. In fact, there was none of them. So I took the 325, the easy close, and the property appraised for 327. Now watch this, I just wrote something on Facebook about this tonight. When you start chasing the escalation clauses, what happens is you always want to take the highest one because you make the most money. But then the problem with that is if it doesn't appraise, then all of a sudden, you're negotiating from a point of weakness because now you have to go back to the person in second place and go, oh, hey, listen, that first offer didn't work. You're second in line at 338. Right. Well, you know, I already bought another house. I'm, I'm under contract for another house. I go, okay, now i got to go to the third person and go, hi, Nicole. Hey, I see that uh, you've got an offer on our property. We'd like to take your offer. She's like, well, you know what? I'm not thinking. Now all of a sudden, you're back to square one. So pick the offer that makes the sense. Don't always go for the dollars. Pick the one that makes the sense, the easiest close, and make it happen. Okay, that's all you gotta do. Any other questions? All right, you guys ready to wrap it up? Did you guys enjoy this tonight? Did you guys all learn something? Yeah. All right. Well, I wanna thank Bill for being here one more time. Let's give him one last time. same deal here in the room as they do online or watch at home. So check out summit.atlantaria.com. That's summit.atlantaria.com. You get the same special. It is a two-for-one special that expires tonight. We've had it going on for about two weeks. It expires tonight. I want to make sure Bill got back here for this event. So check, uh, sign up. Uh, Chrissy's got, uh, can take care of you right outside the door. If you're a brand new member, Sign up tonight. You can have no charge on Saturday. Don't forget. You sign up tonight. No charge on Saturday. If you renew your membership, you can come at no charge. But again, tonight, if you're just a regular member, you're not renewed really tonight. It's two for one special this tonight. What's your question? It's going to be on June 30th and July 1st at the City of Light, right off of 85 and 285 over at Royal 3125 Presidential Parkway. So we appreciate everybody being out there tonight. Get us on Facebook. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the beginning investors group. We'll see you next time. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Bill. Thank you.